So today we're going to sort of shift gears a little bit and we've uh, talk about sort of the, the techniques we use to glue all the components of a modern processing system together. And it's sort of interesting because th those techniques have changed dramatically over the last five or six years. And we seem to be you know, headed in a new direction. But not to fear a lot of the same basic questions that we used to talk about in terms of how to glue an entire sort of large physical system together. Uh, now we're having to revisit all that to think about how to glue thousands of cores together within a single chip. So a lot of the interconnect issues I'll be talking about today are being revisited now in the context of these large multi-core machines. Okay. So the, when you think about you know, all the components that go into a system, so we have uh, you know, different sort of hardware components like uh, different memory systems and, and different storage devices and different CPUs and then the operating systems and, and the sort of interfaces they provide. Um, and you look at how all of these things play together to make an effective computer system. And you ask yourself, well, what's really, you know, who's top dog? What's the most important thing? And the answer is, it's the interfaces. Those are the things that actually survive the generations if technology changes. And so, in fact, the networking software that you're running is not very different from the networking software that ran on the machines of 20 years ago. The notion of doing IP and TCP and, and you know, connecting to computers around the world, even though there's many orders of magnitude more computers to connect to, enough so that we were sort of running out of the 32-bit address space that was originally allocated for network addresses. Um, the, uh, the basic software is unchanged even though we've gone from you know, 1 gigabit chaos net to 10 gigabit ethernet to 100 gigabit ethernet to 1,000, you know, to, uh, you know it, uh, we, we keep changing all the different uh, uh, technologies and yet a lot of the systems remain unchanged and so that's really a key part. And what we'd like to do is as we think about the interfaces, that's really in some sense where the, the big the big investment should go, even though we tend not to. We tend to shrink wrap interfaces around whatever happened to be there at the moment. Say, aha, we'll just call that a standard and then we're done. It turns out that what we really want to do is to pay much more attention to sort of the right abstractions and think explicitly about how to survive technological change. So um, what we're going to do is, is in most modern standards are actually chosen to be sort of independent of particular implementations, which is great. And it should be pointed out that, for instance, the x86 instruction set, which has survived since its original implementation back in you know, the original 8-bit 8088 microprocessor chip, um, is now you know, a, a huge asset to Intel because you know, the world's software sort of has all been compiled down to x86 binaries and the ability to continue to run those programs is of enormous use to Intel. I mean, it's why people sort of, why there's sort of only one processor architecture uh, um, in the sort of desktop and uh, laptop world. Um, similarly, in the uh, mobile world, the ARM architecture has sort of gotten sort of the lion's share of that. It's uh, a fairly energy efficient, uh, space efficient uh, instruction set. And more importantly, its rights weren't owned by Intel. And so a lot of people who wanted to escape the Wintel uh, you know, oligarchy uh, went off and, you know, fell in love with, you know, an alternative. So these things have enormous, you know, consequences over the decades. And you'll probably be involved in at least uh, being experiencing or, depending on how you think about it, victimized by future choices <laughs> of, about these interfaces. And you might want to speak, think carefully about, you know, the choices that you make uh, if you ever have a chance to do that. It's easy to identify lots of problems that can be created by simply um, uh, going with whatever is expedient at the moment. Uh, I remember it was, this was said in a different context about a particular software program, but I've, the phrase has stuck with me ever since. Uh, the David Moon, who was a, a, a staff member here, very, very sharp guy, was, was, looked at, was talking about a particular piece of technology, and he says, you know, a moment of convenience, a lifetime of regret. 
Um, and that can sort of describe the sort of things that can go wrong when you make a, a, a bad choice. And in fact, a lot of the early uh, PC architectures uh, were really just based on the, X, the 8086 uh, chip. And they turned out they, that was hugely limiting and, and probably prevented PCs from, from uh, taking the world by storm, and it was really only after some of those problems that were solved that all of a sudden, you know, mainframes became the tail and PCs became the dog. So, uh, there's been many success stories, and one of the things we'll talk about today is the some of the success, success stories uh, that are oriented about how to communicate information uh, from one part of the system to another, from one device to another. So in the old days, when we had a whole pile of things we needed to connect up, the CPU, the I.O. system, the memory system, the disk, they just, you know, because it was all being sold to you in one big box and it cost a million bucks and there, there wasn't really a commodity market in any sense. So all of these pieces of interconnect were custom designed around what they had to do with really no thought of, well, in 10 years, are we going to be happy with this memory bus? The answer was, oh, who cares? In 10 years, we'll just re-engineer everything, and it will be what it needs to be. So our original machines, there wasn't really a notion of, of you know, sort of plugging other things into your computer other than what the manufacturer supplied to you. And a lot of the earlier angst came in some of the early systems when there were, were third-party vendors who were trying to sell memory systems for the 360 or the, or the Digital Equipment Corporation machines. And there was a lot of, what the hell are you doing? That's our system. You can't plug your thing into it. Um, and, but that was sort of the, the tip of the iceberg now. And pretty soon people came to expect that, in fact, systems should be inherently modular. I should be able to make my own choice for a video card or for a disk independent of the choice I made for the CPU. I might have, you know, want to invest in much higher capacity I.O. system than, you know, Intel was thinking about, and that should be okay. So the first thing that happened was we created sort of a modular interconnect system where everything was connected together by a single uh, communications channel. And the, that communications channel really looked a lot like the pins on the CPU. So that communications channel consisted of you could send an address, you could send data or receive data. There were some control signals which re looked remarkably like the p control pins, you know, read and write and MOE and, and, and write enables and, and the clock signals, all of which looked suspiciously like the pins on the, on the CPU chip. Um, but it sort of got the job where now you would actually buy a different video card. And, you know, depending on whether you wanted high-end video or just simple character-only video, um, you could make some choices here and expect to plug those cards in uh, to, to, to the computer system that you had bought. So there was this notion of sort of user, exp user expansion. And then we got on to these processor-independent buses because it became pretty clear that there were some choices that individual CPU chips were making that weren't long-lived. They weren't forward-looking. They didn't take into account the ability of a very smart network interface transferring information all by itself into buffers in memory without any intervention from the CPU at all. And so we became from a notion where the CPU was really in charge and these guys were all slaves to a much more symmetric uh, idea where each one of these guys could in fact become a master of the communication channel and communicate to whichever other peripherals they wanted. And one of the most important side effects of that is you could suddenly have more than one CPU involved in a system and, and that was pretty neat. Uh, nowadays, we're getting back to the old picture because, as it turned out, that the, as technologies got faster and faster and faster, these, these single communication channels, these so-called bus-based systems, are fine when you have many tens of nanoseconds in which to uh, you know, access, access memory or to send a message to the disk drive or something like that. But as processors became faster, tens of nanoseconds suddenly turned into tens and hundreds of, of instructions. And it became less plausible to sort of shackle the CPU to this, this ball and chain of a very slow common communication system. We'll talk a little bit about some of the intrinsic reasons why these single communication channels are slow. But the system engineers quickly came up 
we started engineering uh, again a, a huge uh, sort of universe of interconnect, each tailored to a specific idea, a specific thing. You know, some of the interconnect was designed explicitly for plugging in external devices like USB. Other was specifically designed for very high throughput reasonably low latency connections to these, you know, to your memory system. And there was really no reason to saddle the memory system with some of the same constraints of, well, you better be able to have it, you know, communicate across seven feet of cable. And the CPU designer said, no way is our memory system going to be across 70 feet of cable. It has, that would make it too slow by far. So they started getting back into the business of designing these special buses. And we'll talk more about where we've ended up in that transition. And in just in case the cartoon on the front of the of the uh, lecture didn't make any sense, you know, so these buses and uh, you know in, in, there was an era in which there was a lot of talk about front side bus and back side bus, and hence you can look at the front page of the lecture and go, ah, the typical feeble 004 joke. Okay, okay. So and there's some question about where we're going, although I think that that has become clearer and clearer in the last couple of years, and I'll say more about that. 